I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Dr. Robert Bashara, Assistant Professor of Psychology and Humanities at Northern New Mexico College, USA. He's here to discuss his work translating Murad Waba's Fundamentalism and Secularization. He's also the author of Decolonial Psychoanalysis Towards Critical Islamophobia Studies and Freud and Said Contrapunctal Psychoanalysis as Liberation Praxis and the editor of A Critical Introduction to Psychology. For more, please visit his website, robertkbashara.com. You can also follow him on Twitter at Decolonial Psych and at Instagram at Basharesta. You can find links to everything in the text accompanying this episode. You can also visit the main page of Rendering Unconscious podcast, renderingunconscious.org. As with all Rendering Unconscious podcast episodes, there is a video of this on YouTube. Just visit Trapara Films YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Trapara Film. That's T R A P A R T Film. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Available from Trapar Books. Visit trapar.net for more information. You can also visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, and follow me on Instagram and Twitter at rawsin underscore. That's R-A-W-S-I-N underscore. And follow me at TikTok at Dr. Vanessa Sinclair 23. To support the podcast, you can visit our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Vanessa 23 Carl. Infinite thanks to our Patreon patrons. I couldn't do this without you. And thanks to all of our listeners and guests. Your support is greatly appreciated. Well, first of all, thanks so much for inviting me back. You know, this is, uh, I love being rendered unconscious. That's one. And then two, uh, I'm not exaggerating when I say that this is uh, probably the best podcast out there on psychoanalysis and theory more generally. So uh, it's always a pleasure. To, to be invited and um, I know uh, you do a lot of work and you know you experience fatigue and all that but please continue doing this important work thank you and thank you for being here yeah so um, so today I'm uh, going to talk about uh, my translation of Murad Wahba's book uh, Fundamentalism and Secularization it's a book that he published in 1995 which I translated from uh, Arabic to English, and it got published earlier this year by Bloomsbury. So uh, probably most uh, listeners, uh, viewers are not familiar with uh, Murad Wahba, so I, I thought I should uh, introduce him uh, a little bit. So he uh, is um, Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at the Ain Shams University in Cairo. He's the author of more than 20 books on philosophy and politics and the co-editor with uh, Mona Abusena of Averroes and the Enlightenment, which came out in 1996. And finally, he is the founder of the Afro-Asian Philosophy Association. Um, he's a fascinating thinker uh, for me because, um, you know, 
to be an Egyptian philosopher or an African philosopher or a philosopher from the global south, you have to be able to engage with European philosophy and uh, read all the classic texts there and then also bring in a completely different tradition. In his case, it would be Arabic Islamic philosophy. And so it's, it's like we have to do more work, you know, not only do we study European philosophy, but we also have to study our own, you know, uh, output. Of course, he's underlooked because he writes mostly in Arabic and he doesn't have a lot of texts out there in, in English uh, or in other languages. Um, so I took it upon myself to make sure that, you know, I bring his insights, his work, uh, for an English-speaking audience, so they don't have an excuse, and they say, "Oh well, we're not we're not engaging with this kind of philosophy because it's not accessible for us." Right? So that kind of gives you a sense of. Uh, uh, so in a way, I, I kind of think of him as a world philosopher. That's how I I like to to put it. Um, and um, I came across his work um, in two thousand and sixteen. Actually, my dad recommended that I read him. So I started reading uh, his work. I was actually preparing for a paper uh, for a conference at the University of Manchester in 2017. And I came across his work and I was like, wow, he has really interesting ideas. And so I started translating parts of his book for my paper. And then after a while, I was like, I might as well just translate the rest of the book, right? And so I reached out to him. Uh, he's still alive. Uh, 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 he's in his 90s and very still very sharp, you know, in his thinking. And I reached out to him and uh, he gave me permission. And I worked very closely with him. So I, uh, I sent him my first draft. He gave me comments and I worked on it again. And at the end, he was so happy with the translation that he told me uh, uh, that he saw me as a co-author of the book, which I found, you know, very flattering and it's very generous of him to say that. So that gives you a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, background. So um, do you want to explore your... some of the go ahead? Yeah, absolutely. But was this your first time translating a book? This is my first time translating a book. Uh, so it was quite the effort and it took a while. Uh, people uh, look at it as if like uh, the book came out of the blue because of, you know, you know how it is because you publish books as well, you edit and, and you write. So you don't know when the book is going to come out and a timeline is very different from the actual work you've done on it. So technically I started working on it in 2016, but it came out in 2022. So it looks as if like all of a sudden it's out, but actually I've been um, looking for a publisher for a while. And then finally Bloomsbury expressed interest and it was, it was amazing. And by the way, uh, I, I got so fascinated with him and his work that uh, I'm editing a, a book series uh, for Gerlach Press in Germany. Uh, so I decided, you know, I don't have to translate everything myself because it's too much work for me, you know, uh, and I need to, yeah, I need to do other things as well, right? And so uh, I'm editing this book series dedicated to some of his works. And we have two translators right now uh, translating two of his books. Uh, for Gerlach Press. Um, so that's that's exciting, just to bring out more of his work. And then after that's done, my plan for the future is to look at other contemporary works um, of Arabic philosophy to translate as well. Uh, so I don't have to personally do it. I can also oversee uh, the project. Just I wanted to see it being done. And actually, my friend, so actually, I want to name out uh, name the, the people doing the translation. So Ziad and Nabulsi is one of them, and May Kozba is the other. And uh, Ziad something, did said something that I really appreciated. Uh, you know, when people in the West or in Europe think about uh, the kind of philosophy that's produced in the global South, you know, mainly Africa, Asia, or Latin America, they think of it in, in terms either of like medieval philosophy, so that's how they situated like something in the past as opposed to contemporary philosophy, or they wouldn't even think of it as philosophy, they'll think of it as thought. So you'll see that term a lot like uh, thought as opposed to, to, to suggest that it's not systematic philosophy, that it's less than. So of course that's a kind of a racist or ethnocentric uh, claim. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot couched into this, I think in a sense, uh, um, it's an important political act to, to translate, right? 
Absolutely. So, yeah. So, he's saying so it's my first think- one. Some people think like oh, they, they don't refer to this like philosophy proper if you're not engaging with the like like pantheon of like you know from Greek till now kind of Western continental philosophy. Right. Yeah, so I mean the story of philosophy. First of all, uh, philosophy is as a term like you wouldn't say specifically European philosophy. When people say philosophy, they're thinking European philosophy, mm. right? Even though they're not saying that. And of course, they're gonna start with, with the ancient Greeks and tell the story from there. And so ignore the contributions of you know the Egyptians, the Chinese, the Indians, or whatever interesting group of people were thinking and writing at that time and producing systematic um, uh, you know, ways of uh, looking at the world, right? And so um, in the case of Murad Wahba, he's actually engaging with the European tradition. But again, as I said, he's doing extra work by having it be in dialogue with a non-European tradition. So it's more work, actually. So there is no excuse that, you know, people should engage with this um, and look at things from a different perspective, learn something new, right? Um, See what a contemporary uh, Egyptian philosopher has to say. So, um, yeah. Yeah, well, I definitely want to see what he has to say, but I just want to also commend you on this project because I think also people should see and it should be inspiring because a lot of times, you know, things happen because one person has an idea and puts it to work and makes it happen. And so you decided to do this and had this encounter, contacted him, and now there's a series of more of his works being translated and that can shift things in the field. So that commend you for that and I hope that inspires other people when they see something or encounter something that they they see there's a hole or a gap in the learning you know you can make it happen bring it to fruition you know yeah yeah and transition is so important right in philosophy um I mean um and so we just need to see more works being translated especially from the global south um works that have been ignored Um, so that's especially contemporary works because again we don't want to just think of you know Egyptian or Indian or Chinese philosophy as you know things from the past but also see what the current philosophers the more contemporary philosophers are saying that way um, we're not always situated in a kind of pre-modern world right Um, so yeah um, we can explore some of his ideas I'm happy to talk about that if you want great uh, so the first key, uh, so obviously the title of the book is Fundamentalism and Secularization. So these are the two key concepts that I'll be talking about. And, you know, I want to accurately represent uh, Murad Wahab's thinking. And that's why I wrote some notes and actually highlighted some things from the book that we can talk about. Uh, so the first, I think, important distinction to talk about is the difference between secularization and secularism. And so the book is called uh, Fundamentalism and Secularization as opposed to Fundamentalism and Secularism. So that's an important point, and I I can talk about that. So uh, for him, whereas secularism, like a lot of isms, right, is an ideology and often a euphemism for Christian secularism, right? Uh, Secularization is a process endogenous to any tradition. So... That's a key distinction. Secularism is an ideology. Secularization is a process. And it doesn't have to be um, situated within a Christian framework. And a lot of the critiques, uh, the contemporary critiques of uh, secularism are about that, that secularism tends to be uh, basically Christian secularism. And if you don't follow that precisely, then it's not secularism. So a good example of that is today in France, there's this term laïcité which is, uh, functions pretty much like a, as an ideology in the sense that uh, um, you, you look at how Muslims in France are being oppressed, uh, right? So um, that's, that's an important distinction to make. And he, you know, in my conversations with him, he was very adamant that it's secularization, what he's for and not secularism as an ideology. Um, also, uh, secularization for Wahaba is critical of the theologization of politics. And that's a core feature of any religious fundamentalism. So he defines it specifically, secularization, as thinking of what is relative in relative terms and not in absolute terms. 
In other words, for him, it's grounded in epistemic relativism as opposed to moral relativism. And epistemic relativism is the idea that human subjects should be able to critically think, write, and talk about any object of knowledge, including taboo ones. So that's exactly what he means. So you can see that it very much aligns with the principle of free association and psychoanalysis, right? Um, and so um, that's important distinction. Uh, so that's that's basically how he defines uh, secularization. Any any kind of associations that you had listening to this? Just keep going. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm taking so, it in. I guess the question, the next question is what is fundamentalism, right? And for him, uh, fundamentalism is a form of dogmatism, which is premised on the fundamentalists' claim regarding their access to the absolute truth. And absolute truth capitalized here, right? So Wahba does not deny the sacred realm. He does not deny that there is truth, but he rejects the fundamentalist literalization of the sacred right? Uh, so for him, interpretation, and again, this is very much aligned with psychoanalysis, uh, interpretation with its emphasis on reason is the opposite of the literalist approach. So it is in this context that Wahba invokes the 12th century Andalusian jurist Ibn Rushd, uh, known in Latin as Averroes, a towering figure in Arabic Islamic philosophy. He cites uh, his definition of interpretation Ibn Rushd uh, defines interpretation as the extension of the significance of an expression from real to metaphorical significance. That's also interesting to think about in Lacanian uh, uh, way. Um, but um, uh, so Wahba's book provides the reader with intellectual genealogies of both fundamentalism and secularization. Uh, and for instance, Wahba argues that Edmund Burke is one of the key theorists of fundamentalism, particularly in his 1790 book, Reflections on the Revolution in France, wherein he critiques the radicalism of the French Revolution from a conservative perspective. So basically, Edmund Burke, a British conservative, is worried that you know, the Brits are looking at France, there's a revolution going on to um, get rid of the monarchy, and he's worried that the same might happen in the UK. And you know the conservative wants to conserve tradition, so they don't. And at the end of the day, they succeeded because we still have a monarchy in the UK, right? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to think about that. Not that French is perfect, of course, as a republic, because it's not. I mean, look at the current election, and you'll get a sense of that, right? Um, but the point is that um, is is this concern about. Uh, what radicalism allows, what makes it, what, what it makes possible in terms of uh, revolutionary change. So that's the, that's the concern here. And so Wahba places secularization in this sense on the side of radical democracy and in a way revolutionary socialism. Um, in fact, uh, the reason why I translated the book is this actually next part. The, the most interesting aspect of the book is his argument about the organic or dialectical relationship between religious fundamentalism on the one hand and parasitic capitalism on the other hand. So uh, in other words, for him, all forms of fundamentalism, religious or otherwise, have an ideological function within neoliberalism. So parasitic capitalism is another term for neoliberalism, basically the kind of capitalism that doesn't really produce goods, but it's premised on financialization. Right. Uh, so for Wahba, parasitic capitalism devours what is against science and reason. That is everything that leads to absent mindedness. He also states, and this is uh, something that renders the book prophetic because it was published in 1995, you know, before 9-11, um, uh, before the whole, you know, terrorism industry and all of that stuff. So he states that terrorism is the highest stage of religious fundamentalisms, okay? And this is interesting to think about because he's echoing Glennon, who said that imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism. So listening to both of them, reading both of them, 
I argue following both Lenin and Wahaba that there is a dialectical relationship as well between imperialism and terrorism, right? That, so that's interesting to think about these kinds of relationships and what's sustaining what, right? Um, in the last chapter of the book, Wahaba makes another uh, very interesting argument. He believes that there's also a dialectical relationship between fundamentalism and postmodernism. That could be, that could sound really weird, but for him, the link between the two is their mutual rejection of interpretation. And again, that's a key word for him, a key signifier that very much uh, echoes, you know, Freud's interpretation of dreams, that whole technique. And so, in other words, postmodernism and neoliberalism uh, are the ideological pillars sustaining fundamentalism in all of its forms. To be clear, because a lot of times when you talk about fundamentalism, people just uh, boil it down to religious fundamentalism. Wahaba doesn't. He talks about religious fundamentalism, but he also makes sure that he is referring to any kind of fundamentalism. So scientism or science as dogma is a good example to invoke here. Uh, in the preface of the book, I cite Paul Virilio's term uh, technological fundamentalism, mm -hmm. which he defines as the religion of those who believe in the absolute power of technology. So central to the dogmatism of any fundamentalist, religious or otherwise, is this belief in their access to the absolute truth. This is precisely what uh, Wahaba rejects. So that's why I call him an epistemic rel relativist, right? Because his concern is that when you have folks, groups of people, individuals that believe that they have access to the absolute truth, and then you have these people in power in politics, what are you going to get in, as a result? Obviously, you're going to get some kind of authoritarianism because they believe they have access to the absolute truth, be that through religion or something else. That's really his, his concern, and that's what his analysis uh, basically reveals. Yeah, and it's just like one step away from saying that you're on the side of God, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, or you know what God is thinking, right? Or what God wants. There's that famous song by Roger Waters, like, What God Wants. Do you know that song? Mm -mm. So, <laughs> yeah, so that's an interesting song to think about in this context, actually. Um, I also so, like... I also like the term parasitic capitalism better. <laughs> mm. Better than neoliberalism? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like it too. And actually, um, it, it's another uh, reference to Lenin because Lenin uh, talks about parasitism uh, even back then when he published that book. Um, so yeah, it's parasitic. It's, 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 um, it's feeding off of itself. It's not producing anything. And that's pretty much what we're dealing with. I mean, Wall Street is the best example of that, right? Um, and the whole financial crisis of 2008, like what, what was it based on, right? And just manipulating numbers and it's completely abstract uh, way of doing things. Uh, and ultimately that kind of approach to the political economy uh, sustains fundamentalism in any form. And this is, this is Wahhabi's analysis, why I think it's, it's really powerful. I think most people will, will locate fundamentalism on the side of religion, but they will not think about its relationship with capitalism or postmodernism. But he shows that they're the relationship. And that's why I think the book is unique and original and powerful, right? Yeah, important. Yeah, so another part that I think is very relevant today uh, one of the most fascinating sections of the book, in my opinion, is his theorization and historicization of the moral majority movement spearheaded by Jerry Falwell in the 80s, right? Uh, and of course, um, Falwell uh, was very close to Reagan. So that's the context. This historical movement goes to show without a doubt the recent evolution of conservatism particularly from the new right. So that's what they were called back then. They were called the new right, uh, the moral majority movement. And then we can see that shift from the new right to the alt-right. So again, another thing that we do is we look at the alt-right, but we don't think about their genealogy, where they're coming from and where they get their ideas from. And Wahaba wrote this book before the alt-right, but he was talking about the new right. 
So I think it is helpful for us today to learn about this, to understand how we got to the alt-right. So um, that's why I think the book is prophetic in many ways, right? Published in 1995, but talking about things that are relevant today and help us actually with our analyses. Uh, the context of the new right was the Cold War, right? Today, with the legal attacks on critical race theory from Republican law lawmakers in the U.S., a fringe right-wing conspiracy theory called cultural Marxism, unfortunately, is becoming more and more mainstream, right? This, I call it non-theory, because it's, we shouldn't actually call it a theory, because it's not at that level. Um, posits this cultural Marxism posits a cultural war waged by non-whites, indigenous and black folks, and non-Christians, Jews and Muslims, using the ideological weaponry of Frankfurt School critical theory. It's pretty ridiculous. But what that's, is it? That's the belief of, of you know, the, the proponents of, so the, the whole attack on critical race theory comes from, from this. So you can see its roots in Cold War thinking, mm. right? And it is ridiculous, but it also enacts the return of the repressed or the return of Huntington's clash of civilizations thesis, which incidentally Wahba rejects. So he talks about that thesis in the book and he presents a, an alternative thesis, which is, I call it an axiom actually, that there is one, only one human civilization in many cultures, right? So I love that idea one human civilization, many cultures, because it's a very humanist way of thinking about world philosophy, world hits, history, etc. as opposed to thinking of a clash of civilizations or an ideological clash, you know, there are many cultures and some of the cultures may clash, probably uh, on the level of fantasy, right? But there is one human civilization. So the problem is when we start talking about clash of civilization, then we're probably saying that there's humans and non-humans or subhumans. That's the problem of that kind of logic. And this is, again, we're dealing with this today, that kind of uh, logic. So cultural Marxism is a fancy cover for a mixture of anti-radicalism, anti-Semitism, and anti-Black racism in particular. And you can see that the roots of it, again, in Edmund Burke, his, his worries about the French Revolution, the kind of worries that conservatives have today, right? So uh, what's interesting is that cultural Marxism has come to displace the Islamophobia industry, which defined the last few decades, not only since the tragic events of 9-11 and beyond, but also since the first Gulf War in the 90s. So therefore we should call it by its name, the cultural Marxism industry, since ultimately these alt conservatives are capitalizing on their racist attacks, which are couched in pseudo academic language of defending Western or European values, right? Ultimately, it's about making money from this. And that's really what it boils down to, right? Uh, so the paradox that Wahba exposes so well with his analysis is that their fundamentalist attacks serve nothing but capitalism itself. They're ultimately not about European or Western values. They're all about actually making money from this, right? And ultimately, these attacks do not increase freedom and democracy, which are not exclusively Western or European values. They're human values. Rather, they actually sustain all sorts of fundamentalism. So that's really, um, you know, how his analysis can be applied. You know, I'm, I'm using it, extending it to think about what we're seeing today. I mean, mm -hmm. you're originally from Florida, so I'm sure you're watching this very closely the whole uh, thing about banning critical race theory from, from public schools and that whole fear, right? So using Murad Wahba, he gives us critical tools for thinking about that and making sense of it. Yeah, no, absolutely, that's brilliant. No, and it helps me understand it better because I've, I haven't really been able to understand what's going on with people being against critical race theory because I don't watch American news so much at all, at all. <laughs> So I haven't really understood, like, um, I, like when I first heard about it, I was like, what is the argument? Like, what are they arguing against it? And it's like, basically, like, they just don't want to tell the truth. They're just trying to cover up telling the truth. So now they've developed right. like a whole, like, kind of imaginary enemy with talking points about like, we're, you know, against this kind of right. 
organized uprising of people i see right yeah and uh, and the link for them if you want to kind of boil it down it's very simply that they are making a link from critical theory frankfurt school to the critical race theory and so it's that simple just the language right and so they're the enemy is the our cultural marxists and uh, basically if you look at the frankfurt school they were jewish immigrants that were escaping nazism and coming to the us so that's why there's the anti-semitism it's really um, they don't like having these critical theorists or critical thinkers who are not, you know, European or Christian. So in a sense, there's honestly, let's be fair, there's a Nazi logic at work or a fascist logic at work here. And of course, it gets extended to critical race theory, which is mostly um, uh, the thinking of black theorists, right? So then there's that anti-black racism. And then you mix the two together, so you got a anti-Semitism, anti-Black racism mixed together with anti-radicalism. And that's how it goes back to, to Burke. So that's why Wahba is helpful here to, to, for us to think about. Uh, so ultimately what they don't want changing because radicalism really what it means is change. That's what radicalism means. What they don't want to change is parasitic capitalism. That's what they want because they make money from it. I mean, if you want to kind of simplify it. And that's why we, I, I talk about it as a cultural Marxism industry. This whole discourse, this whole distraction from actually reality, uh, they, they're making money from it the way par parasitic capitalism works, right? Exactly. They don't actually care about resolving anything or making any real changes. They just want to keep this fucking chaotic machine going because they're making a bunch of money Absolutely. Out of it. And they're publishing books that are becoming bestsellers. So what we have to worry about is that this is... Uh, reaching a lot of people, you know, uh, that's that's the sad the sad truth of it. It's like becoming uh, mainstream. I remember the first time I came across uh, cultural Marxism. This whole conspiracy theory uh, was uh, like twelve years ago. Like a professor that was just trashing Frankfurt School and saying, "If you Google the Frankfurt School, I dare you, you're not going to find anything negative about them." Like somehow. You know, uh, these Jewish intellectuals, these immigrants have controlled the ideology so much that you're not going to find any critique of it. You see the conspiracy like and it's very much similar to the way the Nazis were thinking that there's a cabal of Jews who are controlling things, pulling the strings. And that's why they're the enemy. So I hope that people realize how dangerous that logic is, because ultimately it is a fascist logic. Right. And um, even though Wahba doesn't talk about fascism, I think it's an important term to add to this conversation. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's the next step from fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. Right. For him, it's terrorism, which, again, in, in for the most people, this word have became so politicized that, you know, obviously in my work, I write about this. It's been associated with Islam or Muslims. Right. But uh, any fundamentalist is capable of being a terrorist. That's the thing. So, and that includes uh, non-state actors, individuals, groups, or the state, or any state, right? Yeah, exactly. So no, because it's, it's like, uh, you know, people see the terrorist as the person who acts out on their own or from a small group. And I see it when you were talking about that. I was, I actually had the idea of like the hysteric from long ago. It's like, uh, you know, nobody's listening to her. She doesn't have any cultural power. So she acts out in this way to like get someone, someone to listen, like, look, this is what's happening. Something is wrong here. You know, I saw it kind of similar to that, but people call that terrorism, but you don't call like, like you mentioned the Gulf War, going and creating right. this huge war in other people's countries. That's not terrorism. You know? <laughs> what the right. fuck do you call that? Right. <laughs> right. So that's, that's definitely state terrorism. Um, and, um, and, and that's what's beautiful about his analysis is that it does, he doesn't reduce it to a specific religion or a specific tradition. And again, it's not even reduced to religion only. Uh, his, his, again, his main thing is, his main concern ultimately with his philosophy is politics, how we do politics. And that's why the, the key values for him, uh, if, if interpretation is a key value, and again, that's a, a key psychoanalytic value, we can say, 
which means that it's possible to interpret anything in more than one way. That's really what it's about. As opposed to saying that there's only one way, because that's what people who are proponents of cultural Marxism as a conspiracy or those who are against critical race theory will say that that's really what it's about, you know? And they feel like they have figured it out. They have access to the absolute truth, right? And that's why they're fundamentalists, but they don't see themselves as such. They see the other side as a fundamentalist when the other side is actually what they're doing is they're analyzing and they're interpreting, right? So uh, that's, that's the game that's being played here. The fundamentalists are not seeing themselves as fundamentalists and what they're doing is actually creating a lot of damage. It's total projection. They're accusing other people of doing exactly what they're doing. 100%, 100%. So that's, that's, uh, that's what we're dealing with. And I think it's a, the, the concern now is like, how do we uh, push back against this whole discourse in a way that really looks at history that, that's analytic, you know? So, and that's why I think folks who are um, interested in pushing back, I think I recommend that they read this book because it shows that genealogy. We have to understand how we got to the alt-right, right? How we got there. And he doesn't talk about the alt-right, but he shows you, the movement right before them that led to them yeah exactly this is nothing new <laughs> it's nothing new mm -hmm. right so you have the new right in the 80s and now we have the alt right and so we look at uh you know the events that took place um at the at the capital and we're shocked but it's we're shocked only if we don't have a a, a sense of history and a sense of context and you know um, so once we understand how a lot of this is kind of a, a residue from Cold War ways of thinking, right? The Cold War did not end with the collapse of the Soviet Union, right? It just uh, got displaced. First, the enemy went from the communists to the Muslim, and now the enemy is being shifted again, uh, going back to some old school anti-Semitism mixed in with anti-black racism right and mixed in of course with anti-radicalism or if you want to be more specific anti-communism anti-marxism etc so so i think uh Wahba provides us with important tools especially for people theorists uh, academics non-academics who are interested in psychoanalysis and i know a lot of your listeners uh, are either psychoanalysts or psychoanalytic thinkers uh, I think there's a lot there in terms of the importance of um, uh, interpretation, how that's um, a key value and a praxis, more than a value really, uh, in terms of secularization as a process, right? As opposed to secularism as an ideology. So we don't want secularism as another new religion because that's not the, the point. But that's why we talk about it as a process. When you say it's a process, it's something you constantly do. So it's not something you ever, because if you say it's an ideology, then again, you fall back into the fundamentalist trap of having access to the absolute truth. So he avoids that by saying that it's a process. Yeah, that's great. No, and that I've only done one podcast. I had to go long break, as you know, for like a month. And I did one yesterday. And they were also talking about how important we need to just keep focusing on processes and the processes and not like these kind of like, yeah, exactly. And interpretation is open, which means that we should be able uh, to speak freely. And I think that's also, unfortunately, to be honest, completely, uh, you know, that debate is so saturated and divided in such a way that you have the right or the conservatives claiming, um, you know, that they're the ones who have access to free speech, right? They're the, the free speech fundamentalists. Actually, there's that term, right? Free speech fundamentalism. That's interesting to think about in this context. And uh, I think that the left need to claim free speech as well, right? But not as fundamentalists. That's the difference, but we still have to, and that's I think uh, one of the one of the struggles that we have. What divides the left today is uh, this is one of the issues, like um, because there is a lot of sensitivity, right? 
But as you know, that we have to be able to talk about taboo things in order to get through that, right? And Wahab is not afraid to go there. It's a dangerous territory, but it's um, if we're really interested in democracy, if we're really interested in change for things improving, if we're interested in liberation, I mean, how are we going to get there without being able to speak to one another freely, you know, um, and getting through our difficulties, our differences, because we're not the same. We might be all called leftists, but we're not the same. Yeah, exactly. And people learn a lot from the act of speaking about it. So you might, through speaking, learn what you actually feel. And you also might say something and then think, why did I say that? Or how maybe challenge yourself as to think, maybe I really don't think that way. But sometimes people don't even realize that they were thinking that way until they verbalize it. You know, you see that in psychoanalysis right. all the time. So right. if you don't verbalize things, they're just going to be sitting, you're going to be acting them out and, and acting and acting on them all the time anyway. <laughs> you yeah. Know. Yeah, and the possibility for multiple interpretations, right? I mean, uh, we, we it's hard to, to pin down that you have the one single interpretation. That's again, uh, an absolutist dogmatic position. And the beautiful thing about, I say this over and over, but I really believe this, the beautiful thing about this expression, free association, which is a major technique in psychoanalysis, is that it's more than this technique. It's not just about speaking freely, it's also about freely associating with other people. So it's a practice as well, right? So when you're choosing your comrades that you enjoy being with, that's free association as well. No one is forcing you to be with them, right? you're freely choosing you know, uh, to associate with them because you have similar dreams perhaps or similar desires or you enjoy similar things. So that's also free association. And you can, where can you have that? You can only have that in a democracy. In, in, in a place where there is no democracy, you cannot freely associate because when you do that, that's considered, uh, you know, you're ganging up against the state and that's seen as dangerous. Right. Absolutely. So interesting. Yeah, and I hadn't heard that term cultural Marxism until you tweeted. You were tweeting about it. And I was like, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> now it's I a know. Conspiracy. Yeah, it's a conspiracy. <laughs> That's really if you want to like get down to it in terms of like what they're thinking and all of that. Um, that's uh, that's what they latch on to. And they boil it down to the Frankfurt School, basically. <laughs> yeah it is that's it a is free bizarre, association it, it is a free association a but what what they're not associating what they're not <laughs> analyzing rather uh they're not analyzing the fascist logic of of that association that's i think that's what's really troubling about it you know uh, because i mean look at most of the people speaking on this it's going to become clear they're people who are defending christianity there are people who are defending whiteness. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, and there's, they think that they're the speakers uh, on behalf of European or Western civilization, in quotes. So, like when you have Frankfurt School theorists that are coming from Germany, they're not part of Europe, right? That's what they're thinking. Well, why are you excluding them from European civilization? Because they're Jewish. Do you see it? So, mm -hmm. it's when you, when you follow that logic, it just becomes clear. So, um, and it's, I think, again, what I'm really worried about is that it's mainstream. Look at their books on Amazon or what have you. You're going to see them in the bestsellers. A lot of people are engaging with this. A lot of people uh, are listening to this, are being convinced by this. So that's why it's important to, to push back and not get emotional about it. I mean, the stakes are high because we're dealing with fascism, right? So it's hard not to get emotional when, when there's dehumanization involved. But we have to also offer alternative analyses so that folks can see uh, the, the, the holes in the fascist logic or they can see how that works, actually. You know, this book sounds fascinating. I'm so glad that you're bringing forth more translations of his work as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so... 
those are going to be coming out soon, hopefully. If not later this year, probably next year. Very exciting. And what else are you doing personally? Well, uh, this period, I'm really uh, focusing on my health. Uh, because as you know, academics, you were just talking about uh, burnout and fatigue. And, you know, it's, uh, it's real. I mean, when you're doing a lot of things at the same time, you ignore your body, uh, you ignore your health, and um, it's hard. I mean, if I want to do things, and I want to do many things, I have to make sure that I take care of my body and be healthy. So I'm just being more mindful of that this period. Um, and really, you know, as much as possible, enjoy weekends as weekends, as opposed to this time where I have to do this extra work. In addition time to, to get more work done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, so that's that's definitely something I'm more mindful about this period, uh, you know. And other than that, uh, I have a book that I finished. Um, I haven't announced what it's about yet, but it's finished. Uh, I'm going to be submitting it soon to the publisher. And I'm really excited about it because uh, it brings in psychoanalysis with popular culture in the US. So it's going to be a fun one, hopefully. Um, hopefully a lot of people will enjoy reading it because it basically deals with aesthetics, um, clinical psychoanalysis to some extent. And, and, uh, uh, and so that's, that's more news on that soon. I don't want to announce the content yet. And then, um, I have another book planned, but, um, uh, and that one for later. And then I want to organize a conference next year. I think, uh, we're all tired of, from COVID and from isolation. And it's, I think it's time, we're close to that time where we can gather and do something fun and enjoy being together and freely associate, right? So hopefully um, if there's no other variant of COVID, uh, maybe next spring, spring 2023, um, I'm planning on a conference then and you're obviously invited and welcome to, uh, you know, uh, join in that'd be lovely thank you i right now i'd have no desire to go to the united states <laughs> but yeah, if i were to yeah. go to the united states it would be for you <laughs> new mexico thank you very much new mexico is different too because you've never been to new mexico right no i've only driven through it when i was driving from florida to california oh yeah it was so beautiful it's, it's different i got a speeding ticket yeah, it feels different <laughs> there's a lot of history uh you know, the indigenous presence is strong here, a lot of tribes. So it's, it feels different than the rest of the US. Uh, it feels a little bit um, almost like a parallel world to the US. More like so that's the, cool. the real roots of the, of the place. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. That's a good way of putting it. But, nice. but you see it not as something that happened in the past, but something that's actually ongoing, that's something in the present. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's always amazing. I mean, so I think uh, it's a great location to, to have a, uh, a conference where we can talk about things critically and enjoy uh, being together at the same time. Okay, you've tempted me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be honest, a big part of uh, organizing a conference is an excuse to have fun with people that you enjoy being with. I mean, that's a big part of it, right? And so you, we definitely miss that. And uh, usually I, when I organize it, I organize a lot of extra conference activities. So, you know, hikes, hot springs, good food, the things that, you know, we humans enjoy. Absolutely. No, I totally, Carl and I are doing the same thing this period. It's like taking breaks, listening to our body, eating better, you know, focusing on health and wellness, because yeah, we can get burned out if we take too much on and it's, it's nonstop. You can work on things that you want to work on forever with no breaks, yeah. you know, <laughs> but in order to work the long term, you have to take breaks yeah. and take care of yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. We have also have learned stop. that this year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, because also like COVID-19, like in a sense, uh, paradoxically, productivity increased with people staying more at home and they're being forced to work more because they're commuting less, right? 
So the, the capitalists were like, wow, this is a good opportunity for us to make them even more efficient workers. And, you know, so, uh, but obviously we do this to ourselves too, because we've internalized the ideology, right? Uh, so we overwork ourselves to death. And so, yeah, it's important to stop and enjoy. And, you know, as you said, take breaks and go outside. So, yeah. Eat and if vegan. we don't do this, yeah, we can't, we can't really change things if we're, if we're not able. So, you know, self-care, I talk about it also as community care. The two are interconnected. The two are dialectically related. So you can't have community, community care without self-care and vice versa. Absolutely. And I also just want to mention also, um, since we last talked, Thich Nhat Hanh passed or I know. dropped his body, I, I should say. How are yeah. you doing? How's that been for you? Well, it's hard. Uh, so um, for those of the, uh, the people that don't know about, um, uh, you know, I practiced in that tradition, the Plum Village tradition uh, for a, a long time, for years. And, uh, uh, you know, I received uh, five mindfulness trainings from him directly at a retreat. So that was uh, powerful. Uh, I think it's been difficult since he had his stroke, really, because he wasn't able to speak. So, I mean, basically you see a person slowly dying. Uh, and, you know, a big part of uh, Buddhist practice is to work with death and uh, to accept that. So it's, it's difficult to do, but it's, it's central. Um, you know, a, a big part of it is working through suffering and how to transform that. And there's no way to experience enlightenment if that's possible without working through your suffering. There's no way to bypass that. So that's that's the that's the stuff that we work with in psychoanalysis. That's the stuff that we work with in many traditions, not only in the Buddhist tradition, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to give my condolences. Yeah, thank you. So many lives lost too over the last period, right? Friends, family. Um, so we want to keep everyone in our thoughts and, um, yeah, cause you know, life is precious. Can we stop with that? Yeah. That seemed like a good stop. What, <laughs> what yeah. else is more important than that? Life is precious. I know it is. <laughs> and was, a lot of the time we don't appreciate that, right? We take it for granted. So... It's very true. And if anything, I hope people have learned that from co this COVID experience and this time with all those losses that life is precious and yeah, appreciate it. Absolutely. And then try to enjoy it as much as possible. Exactly. Just, <laughs> uh, enjoy it in such a way that you're not death driven, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so. we talked about that as well. I, I, I came to that crux with Lacanian psychoanalysis and that I, I believe for a long time, it's like at the end of the day, it's all death drive. But I think right. it may be moving out of the city that I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> but it's not, you know? Right. <laughs> Actually, right. there's a life drive. <laughs> it's is. pretty fucking strong. It's created all of this. So. <laughs> Absolutely. And, that, you know, that's why one of the things, you know, because humanism is not a popular term today. And that's a term that's important to me. Uh, and um, uh, what, like Brut, Bruno Bettelheim talks about Freud as being a great humanist. And that's that's important to remember that that's the that's the life drive. The, 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 the death drive is there. And we see it clearly when we see humans being violent and being oppressive and dehumanizing. And so that that does exist and it's it's real, but it's also real that we're creative and we are capable of love and we're capable of cooperation. So we can't just be cynical and say that they're both the same thing. You know, uh, there are two aspects of the reality of being human, but uh, also we have a choice in terms of which one uh, we value more. And yeah, which trying one to we be like dominate uh, conscious us. of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, trying to be conscious of that, right? A lot of people that go to analysis, I think, 
uh, are suffering because they're being death driven and they're trying to overcome that right and um you know uh, and uh, and that's unfortunately as you know capitalism uh supports that because they want us to be worked to death right so you yeah know, you exactly have to kind of... it makes sense then that these theorists so many theorists that come from this capitalist structure then see that as reality right oh it's ultimately all death drive but actually there's other realities and other ways we could live besides yeah. in this way yeah that's exactly absolutely. it absolutely absolutely and i guess that's the point of fundamentalism and secularization is in a sense it's fundamentalism or secularization that could have been a, another title right i think the death drive we can locate it on the side of fundamentalism in any shape or form right because it's uh related to stuckness too right mm -hmm. if you think about it you're you're like stuck in terms of your enjoyment and you don't know what to do and you're not happy but you're also repeating mm -hmm. that's a big part of it right yeah and it's, it's super hard to change too. yeah i think we have learned a lot today i have it's interesting yeah. <laughs> good we, we co-learn I mean, a lot of these ideas, I, I, these are more of those ideas, you know, and I'm just uh, representing them as accurately as possible, but also obviously offering my own interpretation. I can't deny that because there's subjectivity, right? Yeah, well, thank you and thank him for us. And I'm so yes. glad that you're getting to be happy. out there. I'm going to share this with him uh, once it's out. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Dr. Robert Bashara. Check out his books at his website, robertkbashara.com. And follow him on social media. You can also check out our previous discussions Rendering Unconscious episode number 48 on decolonial psychoanalysis, Islamophobia, and creativity, and episode 135 on his book, Freud and Said, Contrapunctal Psychoanalysis as Liberation Praxis. And now a song by Robert Bashara. Whitey on the moon. Enjoy. Whitey's on the moon. Whitey's on the moon. Whitey's on the moon. Yeah. I've been seeing all my people suffer Fighting for financial freedom while everything's going under They want to see us dead and it's not covert or undercover Why are you on the moon? 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 Christ, they come and soon Ignorance will see your tomb Ignorance will see your tomb, yeah Fast food, it'll be your tomb Fast food, it'll be your tomb, yeah Why are you on the moon? Why are you on the moon? Why are you on the moon? What'd you do with all that money, Joe? Do you care about this country or do you want to see us broke while we sit at home? Or should I direct this question to Jeff Bezos? When you enter in the 1% cause that means that you forfeited your halo. No one's doing shit about this financial or climate crisis. We'll need more than a raincoat. These rappers love Ortega, but they're living shameful. Who do we blame more than captured or captors? Atlanta Hawks game, I'm up in the rafters. No happy ending or ever after from what I can see. USA at large with apathy. This pandemic self fulfilled catastrophe. Trying to leave a legacy for every single person after me You gotta see things more objective factually What a tragedy We looking down at people just in raggedy No respect for anyone and it's sad to see I speak the truth, think that's why they so mad at me Live in reality, step out your fallacies They see us as an object, they see us as something they want to dominate Something to control, spend the 
this way for centuries, don't you know? Whitey on the moon, I can't even pay my bills. Whitey on the moon, woke up and I'm seeking thrills. Whitey on the moon, man, I'm really getting chills. Whitey on the moon, I just gotta keep it real. Whitey on the moon, I can't even pay my bills. Whitey on the moon, woke up and I'm seeking thrills. Man, I'm really getting chills. I just gotta keep it real. Whitey's on the moon. Why is on the moon? Why is on the moon?